Hey, last week, can you believe we got two verses done? I promise we won't go that slow tonight. All right. Um, now, we talked briefly about God's holiness because we're going to find out real quickly. Um, in fact, in this very chapter, uh, we have been called to be holy like God is holy. But remember, the root of the word holiness means separate or other, apart from whatever. And we discussed real briefly that that separateness and that apartness and holiness is scary. I mean, like the quickest way I can think to explain that to you without going all over Isaiah chapter 6 again is what is the first thing an angel typically says when he shows up? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And he's not even God. He just, an angel just carries a whiff of the holiness of heaven and people freak out or like uh, Moses. <laughs> I always like describing Moses. He comes down from the mountain and you basically have a three day old holiness sunburn on the face of a sinful man. And it scares everybody so much. They're like, put something over your face, right? That's holiness, right? That's heavy holiness. Okay. So um, not least of all, one thing about real holiness does is it reveals our own lack of holiness, but he's called us to be holy. So not surprisingly, if we're called to be holy, that it has the same effect on other people, non-Christians in the world around us. Now, there's a lot of reasons why Christians are persecuted, and I'm just sort of being, I don't know what, per, uh, what's the word when you, you prompt somebody, you... Prod them. Pro, I'm prodding you, there's a word, I'm being... Provoking. provoking, I'm provoking you, yeah, pro, prodding, provoke. I'm provoking you to think about holiness as one of the reasons why Christians endure um, persecution around the world. Okay, now this can happen in a zillion different ways and has happened all throughout history and all kinds of things, but Peter, very much likely with the help of Silas, specifically in his letter is addressing a mixed group, both Jew and Gentile, in Asia Minor, uh, which is sort of the region uh, of Galatia when, uh, when Paul writes the letter to the churches of Galatia. These are the same places, what we would call Turkey, like near Cappadocia and that kind of area up there. Now, these Christians were suffering persecution from the government. Uh, you know, Rome uh, saw them as unpatriotic um, from religious people, uh, obviously getting a lot of abuse from um, the Jews who thought they were blasphemers and didn't appreciate getting lumped in with all the trouble that Christians were getting into. Um, and also pagans considered them atheists. And also they were putting a crimp in the economy of pagan idol buying for lack of, you know buying and producing idols and selling idols and they were also facing familial um, persecution and it very briefly as i described last week uh a in the roman household by law a patriarch had total authority like literally the power of life and death over everybody in the household under him and if that was that um, if you were like a slave or a wife or a son or a daughter in that household and you became a Christian, and that made the patriarch unhappy. They could make your life really difficult. So Peter begins by calling them strangers. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to God's elect, strangers in the world. And we talked about it at length last week, but this is an undercurrent that is going to uh, occur throughout the letter that is basically comparing these Christians to the family of Abraham, as Abraham also was a stranger in a strange land, a sojourner, as were the Israelites when they wandered in the desert. Um, he's going to be, oh, I put, wandering aliens looking for their promised homeland. He is inviting the Gentile believers that he's writing to into the family of God and very intentionally using verbiage. And we're going to see, well, there's a bunch last week and even some more tonight. And I encourage you to sort of underline and look for these words, linking them together with the family of Abraham and the nation of Israel. Next, he says they are chosen just as God um, chose the Israelites. Um, um, it has, this compares them. Uh, well, let me just go into this. Somebody asked this um, last week, or maybe I brought it up as part of, and then I couldn't think of any verses. I said where there's a verse somewhere where God says, I didn't choose you because you were better than anybody else. I just did. And then I couldn't think of the verse. And I said, can anybody find it? And Cheryl said, oh, it's all through the Bible. And it is. 
But I went and found two specific ones just to prove that I was right. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> just, just because. Okay, so if you're interested in this kind of thing, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 7 to 8. The Lord did not set his affection and choose you to the Israelites because you are more numerous. Now, that sounds like just sort of a numerical thing, but numerous is sort of would have been considered a compliment at that time. Uh, more numerous than other peoples, for you are the fewest of all peoples, which is sort of an underhanded you know, compliment, sort of an insult. But it was because the Lord, and that's Yahweh, loved you. That's why he chose you. And then again in Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 6, understand then that it is not because of your righteousness that the Lord your God is giving you this good land to possess, for you are a stiff-necked people. Matt Dodson, that verse is for you right there. He's, he's had a bit of a stiff neck for some time now. So there, it's not because of your stiff neck, it's but be, in spite of your stiff neck, God loves you, Matt. Okay. Uh, by, by the way, in that section of Exodus, he says almost that exact same thing three different times. Just in that chapter alone. Not because you're righteous, not because you're special, not because you're successful. In fact, if anything, you're not any of those things. It's because I love you. Yeah? How cool is that? Okay, so we covered that. I just wanted to rewind because uh, I didn't have that verse last week. And then he says, you have also been sprinkled with blood. And again, if you went through the Leviticus course with us, you know how that ties them directly to um, Old Testament temple worship. Yeah, and, and a picture of their forgiveness um, through the sacrifice of a lamb. And then he says, grace and peace be abundant, um, which we all agreed last week. Sure sounds an awful lot like Paul and was likely um, uh, through the influence of Silas. Um, but I also thought about that a little bit while I was writing up this review yesterday. Um, very well could have been the influence directly of Silas. But then I also thought, you know, if Silas is hanging out with Peter, for example, and maybe Peter's in a jail cell, we're not exactly sure. Boy, I was thinking, I wonder if Silas did not have copies of Paul's letters with him, right? Could he not have been like, hey, Peter, you should read these, you know? And then when Peter goes to write his letters, uh, some of this salutation might become sort of a Christian salutation that became the style of um, salutation. Okay, anyways, that's just me speculating. So tonight we're going to be covering verses 3 to 12 in chapter 1. And in the, in the overall gist of it, this section is known of as a few different things. In fact, if anything, it was just kind of comical. I, I'm reading four different commentators, and they came up with four different terms for this section. Um, Tim Mackey says, Peter opens up with a song of praise. Um, John MacArthur said, Peter opens up with a doxology, which is kind of the same thing, right? I get it, right? Yeah. Uh, McDaniel says, Peter opens up with a Jewish prayer, but of the sung type. <laughs> Whatever, right? And then uh, David says, with an, he opens with a word of thanksgiving. Which one is it? Yes. <laughs> all, of, all of the above, right? Okay. So, but what I, what I found interesting, and if you've gone ahead and read ahead, verses 3 to 12, um, what struck me when I read it wasn't so... Oh, by the way, uh, one commentator, McDaniels it was, said... He goes, the way it comes out in the Greek, he says, literally between verses 3 and 12, it literally it comes out as one long run-on sentence, like one sentence that just go, goes on and on and on. But when I read it, yeah, you know what it struck me as is um, it reminds me of a Paul letter because what he does is he sort of tells us all the blessings of like, the abundance we have in Christ, and not only like all the abundance we have, but also the fact that it's everything that God has done for us. Now, if, if you're familiar with the letters I'm talking about, think about Romans, think about um, Ephesians, even the book of Hebrews was a lot like this too, where, um, let's just talk about the book of Romans. The book of Romans is basically eight chapters of everything God has done for us. Us. And it's like, God did this, God did that, and then he did that, then he did that, and you did nothing. <laughs> In fact, all you did was make trouble, right? But God did everything, right? Then they take a little weird detour between 9, 10, and 11 that even Paul himself didn't understand, which makes me feel better because I don't. 
Um, then you get to chapter 12, right? And what's the first word? Therefore. In fact, he even says in the Greek, it comes out, therefore, in the view of all these things, right? Ephesians does exactly the same thing. It's just shorter. Three chapters of everything God did for us. And then chapter four starts out with, therefore. My point is this. If you flip over to verse 13, where we'll kick off next week, therefore, prepare your minds for action. Does that make sense? So tonight we're going to get all the blessings laid on thick. And then next week we're going to hear about what do we do with all these blessings. Okay. So um, with that said, um, we start now in verse um, three. Let's just do verse three. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, um, first of all, be aware that this title, The God and Father of Our Lord Jesus Christ, is an interesting title of God. And what it does, actually, what it combines in the midst of all that, is it's not just like giving glory to God the Father, but what's written into that is the explanation of the deity of Christ. Does that make sense? The deity of Christ. In other words, it is claiming the fact that Christ is equal with um, the Father. It's, as I wrote down, it's implicitly referring to the deity of Christ. So when Jesus says things like, he who has seen me has seen who? The Father, right? And so I'm not a real Greek expert, so I'm just taking it on the word of the guys that are really Greek experts. They say that this title, the way it's worded, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, is equating, equating Jesus. Well, wait. I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Tom, tell her we said hi. Um, okay, moving on then. When it says given us new birth, I just thought I'd share this with you. I remember in the 70s um, hearing the term born again, born again Christian. Remember the bumper stickers? I found it. I found it, yeah? I never lost it. I never lost it, right? Yeah, and everybody had a whole bunch of plays on that, right? Um, but I, just so you all know, not that you find this interesting, I just want to put things in context. I always thought before I began studying the Bible, before I became a believer, that born again was just like a catchphrase or a slogan for Christians. And I'll never forget the first time I was actually reading in the scriptures the account of Nicodemus. And, you know, I'll read it to you right here. Nicodemus, you know, who's like, who basically, you know, Jesus says, unless you are born again, you can have no part of the kingdom. And Nicodemus kind of snidely says, and how is a man supposed to be born again? He can't go back, right? You know, and kind of ha, ha, ha. And Jesus answered, and you got to love it when Jesus says this, very truly, <laughs> very truly, Nick, Nico, Nick. He was that night, so it was Nick at night. Um, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. And this is why I brought this up tonight, because I, I find this interesting. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. Yeah. I don't know, but for some reason, when I was studying that yesterday, that really spoke to me about the difference. Because, you know, I like to look at like material versus spiritual Ethereal, is it? Ethereal's up there. Earthy versus ethereal, whatever. And this and that. And it makes logical sense. The physical gives birth to physical, right? And, um, and the spiritual gives birth to spiritual. We are sort of born physically, yet spiritually dead in our sin in Adam. In fact, uh, we covered that today at the baptism, didn't we, today, Matt? About uh, the identi the identi being identified in Adam before we're identified um, with Christ. Now, by the way, it's interesting here because after Jesus explains that to Nicodemus, um, he goes right into the Exodus story. Jesus tells him the Exodus story where, remember, um, when the Israelites were bit by snakes and God tells Moses to make a bronze pole with a snake on it and then to lift it up. And if you had been bit by a snake, you were to look, to gaze upon that bronze snake that had been lifted up and um, Jesus says and now the son of man will be lifted up and he who and it's interesting he says I, I, I look to see he doesn't say who looks upon but he who 
believes upon the Son of Man will be saved. What I thought was cool about that was in the light of being born in flesh, uh, what did I say? What did he say to Nicodemus? Give birth to flesh. Flesh gives birth to flesh. Spirit gives birth to spirit. In the Old Testament, it was a physical malady. Is that how you say the word? A physical ailment. It was being bit by a snake, right? And so they look upon, yeah, and then they're healed. But with Christ, he says, believe in me, right? And it's a spiritual rebirth, not a physical um, healing. Um, and then also, um, I never noticed this before, but um, right before Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, he says this. Uh, Jesus says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes on me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And then he says, interesting to Martha, do you believe this? Isn't that interesting? I never quite realized, you know, I'm familiar with that, these verses, I'm the resurrection and the life. I mean, I remember in the Episcopal Church, that was one of the things we would say out loud in the Episcopal Church. What I didn't ever really quite put together was all of it as in um, our resurrection is actually in Christ. So back to Peter. I took kind of a long detour there, didn't I? Sorry. Um, he has given us new birth into a, a new birth, into a living hope through the resurrection, which is a new spiritual birth in Jesus Christ. So can I tell the story, Matt? This morning we baptized Matt's, uh, Matt Dodson's oldest daughter down at... Um, the Kukula Harbor, and I was explaining to her the theology behind Romans 6, which when Paul says, um, do you not know that you have been, what is it, raised to, um, he says, he says, oh, if you have been um, baptized, then you have shared in the death of Christ. That's when you go under the water, so that you will also share in the resurrection unto a new life, which is a picture of being born again. So far from being a Christian catchphrase or a slogan or a bumper sticker, there's some serious theology behind all that statement, okay? Um, yeah, okay, uh, verse 4 continues with the blessing. In fact, I titled it, verse 4, more stuff to be happy about. Um, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Kept in heaven for you. Okay. Um, interesting. Um, something I learned yesterday. The Greek word for inheritance is the same exact Greek word in the Septuagint in the Old Testament. I'll explain in a second. As the land that was allotted to the Israel nation when, it's, when they divide up the land in Canaan. If you're not quite sure, let me back up for a second. The Septuagint was the first Greek, trans, Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. Somebody help me out historically. I think it was 200 years before Christ. Two or four. Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? Nobody? A couple hundred years before Christ, uh, a bunch of Jewish scholars got together. Actually, oddly enough, at the behest of the Roman um, Caesar. Yeah? And they actually went to Alexandria... And they translated the Hebrew, what we, what we call, they didn't call it that, we call the Old Testament, into um, Greek. You know, what I would almost call New Testament Greek or whatever. And so it's interesting, because of that, we have interesting word parallels. And one of the interesting ones is when Peter says, he's um, given, we, we have a new inheritance, it's the same word that when God's told the Israelites, you will inherit the land when they divvied it all up. So notice again, the physical of the Old Testament being compared to the spiritual reality in the New Testament under the New Covenant. So Peter's telling them that just as Israel received an earthly inheritance, so the church receives a spiritual inheritance in heaven. That was according to John, John MacArthur. Now it's imperishable. Imperishable means it cannot be tarnished the way sinful Israel had what? Corrupted or tarnished, tarnished, it's the same thing, corrupted or tarnished the land, right? Through their, through their sin, which by the way, that alone sort of answers the question, can we still sin in heaven? No, it's in 
corruptible. Our inheritance we cannot tarnish. We cannot corrupt, okay? Um, our inheritance is unspoiled. Um, all of creation is fallen. This is a really interesting concept. Um, I think it was actually, I got it from MacArthur in his book, The Glory of Heaven. His take on heaven is that the reason Jesus talks so little about heaven is because everything that we experience throughout our entire life has been twisted or disfigured by sin. And because heaven has no sin and nothing is twisted and nothing is disfigured, anything that we compare heaven to is such a lousy representative of what it will be in heaven that it's not worth comparing to. Does that make sense? You know, like, um, I'll give you an example. Matt and I are always concerned if we'll be able to surf in heaven. <laughs> and I, right? But I think, like, we're asking the wrong question, right? Because <laughs> the answer is, it doesn't matter. Because nothing on this planet is really going to compare with the splendor of what we have. Sherry, you had your hand up. She had a good question. How then, if our inheritance is incorruptible, incorruptible how could a third of the angels fall well they weren't made in the image of god for starters so we are different creatures so honestly i i don't have an answer off the top of my head i'll google it and then i'll get back to you <laughs> but um but i would say we're, we're of different natures yeah different natures and god has a different scenario for us so, though I don't know the answer to, at least we can take solace in the fact that his word says that we will be incorruptible and untarnishable. So, at least we can bank on that, and then we can ask the other two-thirds of the angels when we get there, what happened? Okay, uh, I think that was it, yeah? Can we move on? All right, verse four. Uh, excuse me, verse five. Um, into an inheritance that can never spoil it. Oh, I, I skipped that. I, I left fade. This is a very quick one. Uh, our inheritance will not fade away. And the word is simply refers um, like as a flower wilts or as a flower fades. Heaven will not and cannot lose its luster. Okay, yeah. And by the way, I use the word heaven, um, but I'm using it interchangeably with inheritance. Okay, most scholars agree that that's um, what Peter was referring to. It was a fut our future hope and glory in heaven. But the word here, just so you know, specifically was inheritance. Okay? Uh, verse 5. Who, oh, oh, by the way, for you, verse 5, you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Simply implies that our salvation still yet awaits and it is being protected by God for us. And most of you that have been around this class for a while know this little theory already because it seems like I teach it almost every book um, we go through. But just in case some of you aren't familiar with this, it is an interesting theology. And that is that the Bible teaches that we have been saved, that we are being saved, and that we will be saved. This is clearly in the, in the, um, in the vein of thinking of um, you will, you know, our salvation is coming. The salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. This is talking about our salvation that will come. Um, and then I just thought, since I tell you that theory every time we come across that idea, um, but I never actually read you the verses, I went and found them. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5, who has made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved, okay? So you have been saved. And then in 1 Corinthians 1, 18, Paul says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being, present tense, saved, it is the power of God, okay? Been saved, being saved, will be saved. Okay, so uh, MacArthur says this, we are right now in what we call sanctification mode, right? In other words, we've been saved, we're being saved, we will be saved. We're, well, to, to quote, um, is it Philippians? Work out your salvation daily with fear and trembling. Doesn't mean you're in risk of losing it. It means learn to walk in the salvation that God is working through you, basically. Um, is like that. It doesn't mean 
try and hold on to your salvation, right? Because then at least I believe that grace would cease to be grace at that point. Okay. Oh, yeah, I guess we can stop right there. We're doing pretty good on time, and we're going we're gonna to enter into a whole new uh, sort of topic. So does anybody else have a question? So I want to I caveat that by adding on to that. The reason he's doing that is because they are suffering greatly, and the gist of his message is rejoice. Well, we're going to get there right now, actually. <laughs> that was actually a very good sort of um, segue into this section then, yeah. Because he's going to say rejoice. You can pay me later. Yeah, yeah. You rejoice in your suffering. This is how you can be glad even. Happy is the word that we're going to come to, which is going to be kind of, well, it comes up in the next verse, actually, which is an interesting conversation. But just in case anybody else wanted to ask anything before we get into verse 6. No? Okay. Well, let's read verse 6. Okay. Um, in this... You greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, while you have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Now, I got to tell you, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to like just kind of monkey with your brain here for a second, okay? Um, the Greek word for rejoice is agalio, I think. I don't know, something like that. Agalio. Agalio. Oh, see, she speaks Greek. Yeah. Thank you. And it's one of my favorite words in the Bible. Is that right? Oh, I love it. Why does that not surprise me, Jen? You of all people, yes. I have an entire sermon around that one word. Oh, I love it. I love it. And you, you, that, you live that out, too. Think of the prices right mm. uh -huh. when someone hits $1. Like when they spin uh -huh. the wheel, right. that's a god. <laughs> <laughs> it literally means to jump up and down. To jump up and down. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, no, so, okay, so perfect. So this is interesting. If it means to be supremely happy... Peter's saying, so in this, you're super happy. And so I hope, so hopefully right now, somebody's going, wait a second, Dane. God wants me to be happy? You're the one that's always saying, God doesn't want you to be happy. He wants you to be obedient. What gives? I'm monkeying with you, right? Yeah? Okay, there's a reason for this. And that is the first words. In this, you greatly rejoice. In what? In salvation, right? What when when people when I Jen, you haven't been around for this, but I had this one guy who he was pretty much convinced when he became a Christian that the point of Christianity and the point of having Jesus in your life was to be happy. Like let's that's God came to make me happy, right? You know. And I told him one day, no, he said, sorry, happiness could be part of the Christian experience, but that is not the purpose. The purpose is actually first to glorify God, and then there's salvation. But obedience is what he truly desires for us. And in obedience, we find love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. But you don't actually find happiness in that list, right? Yeah? So about a week later, he calls me crying in tears. And you know what he says? Well, God must be happy because I'm not. <laughs> anyway, so here's the thing. He says this, be supremely happy in this, in our salvation. Now, when I, um, that's what MacArthur said, but also in um, um, David's, and whenever I say David's, it sounds like I mean King David. No, no. David's, it's an awkward last name. Maybe I'll start calling him by his first name. I think it's Jeremiah. Anyway, no, that doesn't work either, does it? Yeah. Um, shoot. Um, he, he's the very egghead commentary. And he, he says this. He says in the Greek, and again, I don't understand enough Greek to know this. Maybe Jen does. But he says that word rejoice is actually linked all the way back to living hope. Okay? So we're rejoicing in the living hope of our salvation. Okay? Okay? That is where our happiness, which is 100% rooted, because the word hope is always what? Future tense, right? You don't, what is, even the scripture says, you don't hope in what you have, right? Hope is always in the future. So he says we, ha we are supremely happy in the living hope, future salvation that we possess. And oh, here's what David's wrote. He said, it's not a continual feeling of hilarity, <laughs> okay? I like that word. But because suffering for a little while is contrasted with sure and eternal inheritance. Okay? So it doesn't mean just constant hilarity. But the, the, the temporal suffering is contrasted to the eternal glory that we get, which allows us 
to be um, supremely happy. And for some reason, I put this little story in here. I'm not exactly sure how connected it is now that I see it, but I'm going to tell it to you anyways. Um, <laughs> thank you, Maddie. You're laughing. I haven't told the story yet. But um, one time, my good friend bought a piece of property in Kaloa. Maybe I told this to you guys before. I forget what. And um, they bought a tree that was very small, but it was one of those trees that in 50 years was going to be 60 feet tall, right? And he said he and his wife got in this long, heated argument about where that tree ought to go. And he said, well, we took it pretty seriously because a 60-foot tree is no, <laughs> no small part of your yard. And then he said, you know what happened, Dan? I said, what? He goes, I realized, you know, by the time that tree gets to 60 feet, I'll be dead. What do I care where it is? <laughs> so, honey, you can plant it wherever you want. Now, I know this sounds silly, but I'll be honest with you. For some reason, that little funny story he told me actually really put my whole life in perspective of being temporal. Does that make sense? I know it's a goofy little story, but you know how sometimes things just click? And I began to think about, like, well, how much do I care about something 50 years from now? Not a whole lot, really, because I don't expect to be around. I don't want to be around in 50 years because, you know, the way the tech is going these days, who knows, right? Okay, so here's the thing. I can't emphasize this point enough with you about what we're reading about here, this temporal suffering in the light of the eternal, imperishable hope of the future salvation we have is this. Remember what Jay Wayne said on Sunday morning? I thought it was really cool. Right before um, we sang... Um, uh, blessed be your name or whatever. He says, um, Christianity squarely acknowledges suffering. It doesn't sugarcoat it. It doesn't ignore it. It's not whistling in the dark. But our faith takes a square look at the hard things of this world and recognizes them and acknowledges them for what they are. Terrible, horrible things. But it says, remember, you can still rejoice because these are temporal. And even Jesus himself said, you will suffer great, and you, in this world, you will have great trouble, right? But that, what we look forward. In fact, I want to show you something. Um, oh, no, no, I'm not going to show you right now. Uh, but I would just roll it back to Christ, our suffering servant. So in Isaiah, there's chapters that are actually, excuse me, titled the suffering servant, referring to God's son who will come down the anointed one. Psalm 22 describes in minute detail the death on the cross that God's Messiah, God's son, um, will suffer. Jesus says this, after I have suffered many things, suffer. He, he predicts his own suffering. And even, I wrote this for some reason in chapter four, Peter says, therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves with the same attitude. So notice this, our God comes and he suffers, what? For a little while, right? Knowing, what does he say? For the joy set before him, our salvation, right? Therefore, we arm ourselves. Well, we haven't got there. We'll get to the fourth chapter next year, probably at the rate we're going. But um, he tells us, arm ourselves with that same attitude, okay? Because as we're about to find out in the next verse, these trials that we and the suffering that we have aren't for naught. Here, let me explain. Verse seven: These have come. These are the these are the suffering, the suffering trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine, genuine, and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So the purpose of trials or the function, I like the word function almost a little bit better because the purpose of trial sounds like God purposely gives you a trial. Now, I'm okay with the idea, you know, I, that's okay because God is God. He's sovereign. If it's his goal to purposely cause you to suffer because it will refine your faith, I'll give, him, I'll give that to him. However, um, as one commentator once said years ago, I remember I was studying the book of James. He said, hey man, every day is a trial. Our, our world is so full of trials. Our day-to-day -day life is just 
chock full of them. It's almost as if God doesn't have to purposely give us one. But I also want to share this with you. This is just a little interesting tidbit word. What do you call wordology? Etymology, right? Etymology? Anybody? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Nobody else has to Google it. Etymology. Um, the word for trials, parasmos, is translated one of, uh, one of three ways. It's either a trial, a test, or a temptation. Isn't that interesting? Here's the difference. The Bible translators, for the most part, if it is a trial to be endured that produces perseverance and all the things we're going to get to in a second here to grow your faith, then it's of the Lord. If it's from Satan, it is translated as a temptation that seeks to destroy you. Now, somewhere I think up in the <coughs> upper land somewhere, which in other words means in the land that I don't understand, I don't know that you could deviate between what is a trial, for, excuse me, a trial from God and a temptation from Satan, or perhaps somewhere it's related to your response from it. If it's a temptation that leads you into disaster and it causes the enemy to rejoice, or if it's a trial that leads you into faith that causes God to rejoice, it's just a really interesting word to me that sometimes is translated as, so I have been parasmused by Satan, or I have undergone a parasmus by God. Isn't that interesting? Okay, I don't know that I can describe it any better, but I just always find that. Um, but for some reason, I wrote this down uh, when my daughter was going through a bit of a trial last year. I, I told her this. I said, well, sweetie, you can either let this be something that is a wound that destroys you and destroys the rest of your life, and you can point back and blame it from this, at this time, or you can let it be something that God heals and causes you to grow as a person and mature in Christ and be someone that now can help others walk through a similar trial. It's your call, right? Okay, anyways, I don't know if that helps. Okay, most of you are kind of familiar with the idea of what the purification process is because I think we all grew up singing Refiner's Fire. My right, my heart. But we all know that we all know it's called a saying, a saying metal process of purification. You know, you put gold under extreme heat and all the impurities rise to the top and are scraped off. And so that is sort of what takes place um, in the soul through the purification of your faith, um, which is being compared here to that style of metal working. But Peter makes it clear that you know that your faith is way better than gold because even all the gold on this planet will someday perish but your faith will not you, you are guaranteed an eternal inheritance long after all the gold on the planet is no more um, now the last thing i found really interesting about this and i wonder if i'm not the only one that questioned this when you read this Da, 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 da. your faith, which perish, blah, 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 which is worth more than gold, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Wait, who gets the praise? I mean, oh, when we praise Jesus? <laughs> I know, it's an interesting question, huh? Well, believe it or not, all, all my commentators agreed, no, he's actually saying praise, honor, and glory for us. Uh, so, such so, and almost all of them quoted the same verse. If you get to hear those precious words, what? Well done, good and faithful servant. Yeah, that is God giving us praise. Yeah, for us. Yeah, well done and good. good. Uh, by the way, we, uh, we said that a lot about Bob Holman on Saturday. And then they sang, actually they did a hula to a very beautiful song that the title was Well Done. It was, uh, it was, it was, Really excellent, yeah? Now also notice it says, when he is revealed. Um, this kind of goes back to that idea that the victory has been won. Jesus is reigning in power, in authority, in splendor. He's in glory, in heaven. The victory has been won. It just hasn't yet been revealed to the whole world. And when we die, it will be revealed to us. And for those that are still alive, when Christ comes back, it will be revealed to whoever is there 
at the time. All right? Verse 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. I wrote Thomas. Anyone? <laughs> Nobody got that. Please tell me. You got that. Yeah. You just didn't laugh. But you know what Thomas I'm talking about, right? What does Jesus say to Thomas when Thomas is like, <laughs> not until I put my fingers in the holes am I going to believe. And then Jesus shows up and he goes, put him right there, bro. Right? And then he says, oh, it's good that you believe, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet um, believe. Um, I don't know if I've ever shared this story with you, but it's sort of part of my testimony. I thought when I came home from a midnight mass Christmas Eve service at age eight, I was having questions about God. And I laid in bed looking at the eucalyptus tree outside my window, Southern Cal, circa 1978, yeah? And I said, Jesus, if you're real, I want to see you. And what I was imagining in my head was actually, oh, you know, Jesus popping his head up and looking in my window, which he didn't do. But it's interesting, I forgot about that prayer. Uh, but at age 25, Jesus showed up in my life. In fact, my words to um, Pastor John Sadler Creature, the very next day when I explained to him, I told him, I didn't remember saying this, he reminded me years later, I said it was as if I could suddenly see and understand, right? Isn't that interesting? Like I had seen um, Jesus, something happened there. Now, with that thought in mind, there's a reason for me telling you this story about my testimony. Remember from that Sunday sermon just two days ago? Who was that? That was good, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But remember, um, there's this whole theme about Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah says, you know, the Messiah will come and the blind will see and the deaf will hear, right? And then Jesus says to those who are hard of heart, hard of heart, you have eyes to see, but you do not see. And you have ears to hear. No, he says you have ears to hear, but you do not listen. You have eyes to see, but you don't understand because your heart is hard. Do the math all the way back to the little prayer I said when I was a kid to what Jesus revealed to me. It was never about what I would see. It was what I would understand. Is that you got you got that with me there? OK, so Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And if that sounds like it's a consolation prize, it is not because we are the reason I say that is who among us has not wished wouldn't it be fun to go back in time and walk with Jesus around? I mean, really, come on. Have you ever watched um, um, Risen, the movie Risen? I walked out of that and I was like, I want to do that. I want to sit across a campfire from Jesus and just listen to him talk for like months. <laughs> Eternity, right? Yeah, I mean, I know what you're all thinking. Only months, Pastor? Yeah, well, then I get sick of him. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Saying that I didn't see Jesus with my eyes, but I only understand him in my heart, thinking that that's some kind of consolation prize is to not actually understand anything, right? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe, because it's all about what you understand in your heart that causes us to be blessed, okay? And um, that leads us to um, the salvation of our souls, um, <laughs> Verse 9, and then I'm going to take a break after verse 9, and then uh, we have time for questions, and then 10 and 12, uh, 10 to 12 should go pretty quick. Um, just so you know, we're doing fine on time. Verse 9, for you are receiving, and I love the present continuous tense of that word, you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Um, I, for some reason, when I read that, thought, you know, nobody's ever talked about soul before in history up to this point. Um, turns out I was way, way wrong on that. Yeah, the concept of soul goes way back to the Egyptians and the Greek, early Greek philosophers. And I was completely bad. In fact, I actually had to erase about three things I wrote. Good thing I looked it up, right? So I actually um, went to Wikipedia. <laughs> And I went to Wikipedia because I was interested in 
pagan religion's belief in the soul. Because I know, you know, because I, I quickly found things in Christian writing about what Jews believed about the soul, um, you know, and what uh, even Egyptians and stuff. But I was specifically wondering what Roman pagans believed about the soul. And I figured Wikipedia would have it. And interestingly enough, you know, Wikipedia, I wrote in soul, S-O-U-L, and it took me to a page and it said soul. And then in parentheses, it said not to be confused with the capital of North Korea or South Korea. <laughs> It's not, it's not, I know, like, because that was a problem, I'm sure, with somebody, right? Yeah. Um, but um, what it really, um, what it's really saying, okay, so I studied soul from Egyptian Greek concepts to the Old Testament, Hebrew, and all that, to basically then come back and start reading um, what the commentators were saying about it. And apparently, according to the Greek, the word for soul actually is translated psych. So it's almost like a mental thing more than anything. And all the commentators said, this is, all this is really saying um, is that you, you will be saved. You are receiving the goal of your faith, your salvation. And it turns out the whole soul thing was just kind of a waste of time. But there, I just wasted four minutes of your time too. Okay, so let's, let's go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, verses 10 and 11. Concerning this salvation... The prophets who spoke to, of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest of care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. Um, let's stop right there. That's verses 10 and 11. They, these prophets of the Old Testament were looking forward to a special time that God would send his anointed one, the Messiah, and by the way, not just for the Jews, but for all the earth. So I'm going to have you do this. Turn to the book of Isaiah. Hit reverse in your Bibles or scroll backwards if you have an electronic Bible. And we're going to start in Isaiah verse, uh, excuse me, Isaiah chapter 45. I love the book of Isaiah. Isn't that just a phenomenal book? Uh, Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45, we're going to start in verse 20. Isaiah 45, verse 20. Gather together and come. Assemble, you fugitives, from the nations. Ignorant are those who carry about idols of wood, who pray to the gods that cannot save. Declare what is to be. Present it. Let them take counsel together. Who foretold this long ago? Who foretold this long ago? Who declared it from the distant past? Was it not I, the Lord? And there is no God apart from me. Righteous God and a Savior. There is none but me. Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, by my, um, my mouth has uttered in all integrity, a word that cannot be revoked before me. Every knee will bow, by me every tongue will swear. This is a picture of God addressing everybody on the planet. Pagans drop your wood, drop your stone, right? I am, gonna, I am gonna be coming for all of you. Now, interestingly enough, if you bump up now to uh, chapter 53, so go forward, chapter 53 verses, and I'm just gonna grab some, it's pretty much all through 53, but let's look at the suffering servant. Ch uh, chapter 53, verse four, surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God smitten by him and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. If you're wondering why I'm reading these, remember the Peter verses were saying the Old Testament prophets were looking forward, okay? They were looking forward to a day when God would send his suffering servant for everybody. And then just because I love these verses, we have to wrap up with uh, chapter 66. I just love this picture, um, which is sort of, um, some people think it's the end of days or whatever. Chapter 66, um, verses 18 to 21. And because of their actions and their imaginations, I, I am about, and I, because of their actions and their imaginations, I am about to come and gather all nations and tongues, and they will come and see my glory. And I will set a sign among them, and I will, a sign, I wonder if that's the cross, I wonder that, yeah? I will set a sign among them, and I will send some of those who survive to the nations, 
to Tarshish, to the Libyans and the Lydians, famous as archers, to Tabal and to Greece, and to the distant islands, bingo, the, <laughs> aloha, and have not heard, that have not heard of my fame or seen my glory, and they will proclaim my glory among the nations, and they, he is talking about everybody outside of the nation of Israel, and they will bring all your brothers from all the nations to my holy mountain in Jerusalem as an offering to the Lord. And I love this visual right here. On horses, in chariots, and wagons, and on mules, and camels, and tacomas, says the Lord. <laughs> they will bring them as the Israelites bring their grain offerings to the temple of the Lord in ceremonially clean vessels. And I will select some of them also to be my Priest. Remember Hebrews, are we not a royal priesthood? Yeah, says the Lord. Now with that in mind, we go back and read Peter. Verse 10, concerning the salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you, searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out, by the way, time and circumstances. Apparently the word circumstances refer to the looking for the person. Who would be that person? Not only when that person would come, but how would we recognize that person when he comes? The point is this. Salvation. Salvation is not a product of Christianity or the Christian experience, but it is the fulfillment of an expectation of a pre-Christian Judaism as far as Peter and all of us are concerned. And so, again, I wrote in my notes, after going through the book of Hebrews last year, this might seem super elementary to us. Well, duh. You read the book of Hebrews, and Jesus and salvation and grace is all through the Old Testament. But again, remember, this might have been earth-shattering news to converted Jews reading this, and also to the pagan Romans. Can you see the pagan Romans going, wait a minute, you mean these Jews, the ones we conquered, and the ones we have been persecuting? For all these years, they were holding the keys of salvation. They were God's original chosen nation. And now we are going to sort of be coming under their God. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So however much the original audience hearing this letter was suffering persecution, they stand in a position, think about that, that even the greatest of the ancient prophets did not have. Remember when I brought it up on Sunday morning? Um, Jesus says, you're getting to see what those guys would have killed for. You're getting to hear what those guys longed for. And I'm here right now, right? So my big point on that on Sunday was we have the gift of knowing all this. Not to mention the fact that we have all the scriptures plus all the writings of the early apostles and the writings of the early theologians like Augustine, Origen, Aquinas, and Luther. And we get to have it all right on a phone. We have no excuse. We have, we have no excuse. We carry it in our pockets, all of this. And we have an indwelling Holy Spirit, which they did not have. Well, actually, I take it back. The Old Testament prophets were anointed by the Spirit. I, what I should have said is, we have the Spirit just as they did. Yeah? yeah? But we have all this knowledge they didn't. Um... um I love also that they were trying to figure out when the time would be and the who circumstance. And I immediately thought of John the Baptist. Uh, are you the one? Remember from jail? Are you the one we were expecting or should we be expecting somebody else? Yeah. <laughs> Even he wasn't totally sure. Okay, we're almost done. I'm, we're about, we've got about three minutes left and we've got one more verse. Verse 12. It was revealed to them, the Old Testament guys, that they were not serving themselves but you. What? When they spoke of the things that now have been told by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, even angels long to look into these things. Yeah, um, I think I'm just going to skip through some of these proof texts on, on that. Um, but um, I, just, I just love this last bit about um, when it says who preached the gospel. Like who, who's, who's doing the preaching according to this verse? I love this. It's the Holy Spirit, yeah. I, I love that he says, um, they were thinking of you, and, and you have now been told by those who have preached the gospel to you 
by the Holy Spirit that was sent from heaven. Every time you share your faith through word or deed, yeah, that is the Holy Spirit preaching the gospel through. And then last of all, and I'll wrap up with this thought, even angels long to look in these things. And um, um, I, I love this. In the Greek, when it says even angels long to look into these things, it's the same exact Greek word, parakupsai, which um, in the book of John, you know, when Peter runs to the grave, because um, he's told that our, our, you know, our Savior is gone. And it says in the book of John, he stooped to peer intently into the empty tomb. Okay, so it's like this. <laughs> this is what they, Peter was like, is he in there? Is he in there? Right? Okay, I had to do this. Oh, sorry. I'm off camera now. Sorry about that. We'll, we'll try a 3D hologram next week. It'll look, it'll look much better. Just bear with me. You remember Jim Wilson? Key, remember Key Wilson? He once described to me what it was like in heaven um, on the day of my salvation. He said it was like the angels were going like this, looking down, going, no way is he going to save that guy. God can't save that guy. He's way beyond. And then when he does... They go, yeah, unreal, God, that's God, right? Believe it or not, that's what all the commentators that I read said is going on here. The angels are standing by watching all of this intently. Why? Looking into these things, because what is their job to do then? To praise, right? Such that for every great thing that God's grace takes, uh, that perpetuates, I should say, they erupt into praise and prayer like imagine um the night uh since we just did christmas yeah the shepherds in the field on the night that jesus was born right i imagine them peering intently what's god gonna do this is whoa whoa and then jesus arrives as a baby and then the shepherds get to see let me show you something you know oh, right oh, right yeah they're going off in heaven okay so um there was a lot of conversation going around, uh, around here, around, around the church uh, yesterday and today, and my own household um, over the last couple of days about how suffering leads to the um, suffering leads to the purification, purification to salvation, and it leads to astonished praise. That's the word I used. I think I got that from the commentators regarding the angels. Astonished praise is our sort of the end result of of our salvation. And so um, I'll wrap up with this idea. I always feel like um, preachers should preach the word astonished about a grace and salvation. Um, those of you, any of you here play music with me on Sunday morning? Steve does. I'm always hammering on the worship band. Hey, you know when you're singing, you know, a line that says, shout with great joy and, and, and jubilation? Yes, yeah, smile at least, you know, <laughs> shout with great joy and jubilation. I fall on my face at your, you know, really? Come on, man. Like we should be the happiest, most joyous people on the planet, astonished because of our salvation. And then a word to us when we suffer, right? Like to take stock of these terminal, the terminology that we've learned um, tonight that we can have great joy and great happiness even in the face of great trials because we understand that these are temporal, physical things that will pass. But as my sister Donna said, our faith is much more valuable than anything on this planet and it is imperishable and we are it in faith. Amen? Okay, I went a, a two minutes too long. Forgive me. Let's go. Father God, thank you for this night. Thank you for this teaching. Father, we especially pray for all that are suffering right now to one degree or the other, God, um, knowing that you are plowing the fields of our hearts, Lord. Remind us again, Lord, as we go on in this fallen world, in this broken world where so many things go wrong, that we get expressed joy because we know you and we know that our salvation, God, is held securely in your hands of a much greater worth than anything this planet could ever offer up. We give you astonished praise, God, in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Sorry, I got a little squeezed in at the end there, but...